Hello again, fellow audiophiles. I am Wave Theory, and today it is time to get back to the Dan Clark Audio Expanse and do the full review of this one. So this is a 4,000 US dollar flagship open back top of the line planar magnetic around the ear headphone that was sent to me by a friend of the channel. So I have no affiliation with Dan Clark Audio. So we will dive into this review here in just a moment right after this act of shameless self-promotion. Hey, thanks for watching this video. Please remember to hit that like button and if you haven't, please subscribe. Also, I have a Patreon set up so that you can help support me on a monthly basis, and I've set up a PayPal donation so that you can help me out in that way too if a monthly dis a subscription does not make sense for you. Links for all of that, including the benefits, in the description below. Please check those out. All right, on with the show. All right, so the Dan Clark Audio Expanse. Again, $4,000 US dollars. It is Dan Clark's uh, top of the line or flagship open back model. And uh, yeah, we will dive into this one here. So if you listen to Dan Clark talk about this uh, headphone, and I will link to an interview that he did with DMS uh, at the headphone show from uh, Can Jam SoCal, um, in the description below, like you can tell there was just a ton of research and a ton of science and all of that that went into the design and the build of this headphone from a sonic standpoint as well as a physical build standpoint. So I will try to comment on all of that as we get into it here. And this being a top of the line flagship model that costs 4,000 US dollars, uh, I have a fair amount of things to say, not only about its performance, but I also want to make some comments about the $4,000 plus tier, that top of the line flagship tier. Uh, I, I want to spend some time in this video talking about like, what are you actually buying when you buy a headphone at that price level? Uh, and what are you what are you paying for? Um, those kinds of things, so that we can have a little bit more contact uh, context to not only talk about where this headphone fits into that market segment, but where its competition does as well, because I think that is important. So I will timestamp this video so that you can jump around and watch the parts that you deem most relevant, um, if you wish. Okay. So we've already covered some of the build aspects, like it's an, uh, an around the ear, open back, planar magnetic headphone. It really is a, a good looking headphone here. Like there are some interesting design elements to it. Like we have this folding gimbal system here so that it folds up nice and tight. And it says right on Dan Clark's uh, website that you know it's travel friendly. And that's true because it fits into a carrying case this size with a nice little zipper on it here okay just looks like that on the inside it fits right in there it's rigid enough okay that um it will protect the headphone fairly well if you uh, want to take it on the go stick this in a suitcase stick it in a backpack you know that sort of thing okay so that's one design element that it has you also notice like the headband is very different than other headphones. You just have this really springy metal. I don't know what kind of metal that is. Doesn't really matter, um, I think, there. But with just these two bands right here that put the clamp force on the head. And then we have this elastically loaded uh, suspension strap here where this is leather, as far as I know, or at least a faux leather. But it's a nice quality material. And then we have this stretching mechanism here that automatically adjusts the headphone to the size of the, the head of whoever is using it, okay? So you can see on my average size head, like it stretches, you know, that much, okay? And that sort of thing. And like, not only does that elastic system uh, stretch to fit head size, it also ostensibly holds the headphone in the proper place on the head. Okay, so that's a, it has a, not only, again, a size and comfort thing, it's uh, adjustable uh, and, and hold, it's, it's useful from the standpoint that it holds the headphone in, in place uh, appropriately, I should say. For the most part, the clamp here is still not very strong and there's still a fair amount of, of wiggle. Like if you are a head bobber when you listen to music, like I can feel it and hear it sliding around on my head a little bit still, okay? Um, so that's the thing that happens. But as far as comfort goes, 
like it's well designed and all of that from an ergonomic standpoint and comfort like you can wear this for a long period of time at least i can wear this for a long period of time without physical comfort issues either with or without my glasses um, and that sort of thing but i mean other than that the attention to detail in the build here is high like this grill material um, the pattern on it looks cool it has kind of this concave um, design going on it here and there's this nice subtle blue color behind the the holes of the black grill to just kind of give a little bit of an accent and an offset there so i mean it is i think it's a good looking headphone and i mean yeah when we uh we audio files come running as fast as we can because audio files are crazy for a sharp dressed can yeah we're gonna go with it all right so that is all good it, so again it doesn't clamp super hard it does slide around on the head a little bit at least for me i think the bigger your head gets honestly the less it will slide around your head uh because this is going to pull more and elastic materials tend to exert more force the more you stretch them so I think it'll clamp slightly harder the bigger your head gets, and that might have some sonic impacts. Now, maybe it won't. Maybe the, the fancy Space Age materials that Dan talks about here uh, makes this a linear adjustment, but no, no. Yeah, it's definitely harder to pull it back the further it gets, right? So, I mean, that's just the nature of a material. Um, going on there. So that's another thing to keep in mind too. And yeah, we'll get into that in a, in a moment. Now cable, it has a dual entry detachable cable. You get the a stock, you get options for the stock cable. It comes with a Vivo cable. I got the four pin XLR here. And then we have these uh, spring loaded. Okay, uh, let's see how many pins are in there. Four pin connectors that go into the headphone. Um, I don't remember what these are called, but they also, I mean, they're spring loaded. They lock into place, all of that. So um, that's there. I, the whole locking the cable into place thing. I don't know if I love that generally speaking on headphones. Um, part of the, to me, part of the draw about a detachable cable system is if that if you do catch the cable on something, you snag it on something and it pulls, it just pops right out without damaging anything. These, because they lock into place, like if they get, if the cable gets caught on anything and you move, um, you'll feel it pull your head down. And that of course puts stress on the 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 connector now this is not exclusive to dan clark like odyssey's zmfs those mini xlrs they lock into place the final d8000 pro has this twist locking thing on the headphone like that locks into place and all of that so i mean this is not just a dan clark thing it's common it's just a general comment that i think needs to be said now one of the reasons that i noticed this is this why this connector right here, this split in the cable has some bulk to it. And these are just the right length that when I have these plugged in, okay, and I like do something at my desk, I like lean forward. Again, I've talked about how I'm a professor and I've got papers to grade and all of that kind of stuff. Okay, and I like lean forward while I'm wearing these to look at what I'm doing. This part right here can get caught between the edge of my tabletop and my belly jelly right it'll just get stuck in there between those two things and then i'll hear something like you know a family member will come in and say ask me something and i'll pick my head up and it's just like oh caught right so that's a contrast with something like the dual 3.5 millimeter connectors that uh, hi-fi men uses and i think utopias did this too where like if you pull it hard enough they'll just the cable will just pull right out and it's annoying and it alarms you at first but it doesn't damage anything or put unnecessary stress on the joints uh, okay so there's that bit that i thought was worth mentioning okay um these are really hard to drive. I could not find uh, specs in terms of impedance and sensitivity and all of that, but they are up there with Abyss headphones. They are up there with Dan Clark's own Stealth. Uh, they are up there close to Susvara in terms of how difficult they are to drive. They are a load on an amplifier 
uh, and all of that. So um, not quite as hard to drive as the SUS is, but not far behind. And I think that is a relevant point um, as well. Because of this folding gimbal thing here, and because of this nice, maybe folding gimbal, there it goes, okay, and because of this nice carrying case you get, it again, and the wording of Dan Clark's website, which explicitly states so, say this is travel friendly. Physically, that's true, but the number of mobile amplifiers out there that will comfortably power this thing. And I don't just mean from a raw spec standpoint. I mean able to drive it to the potential that you are trying to get out of a $4,000 headphone. The number of portable mobile amps that can do that is very small. Okay. Um, my Cord Hugo 2 can push these. They, it could also push the Stealth. But you are, if you know uh, anything about the Cord, Cord Hugo 2, and I have a review for it, which I will link to, its volume is controlled by this color-coded wheel, and you push it all the way up. This is getting all the way into the white zone on the volume output on that color wheel on the Hugo 2. So it can drive it, but boy, you're sacrificing almost all of your headroom to get there. Um, all that and likely also draining the battery pretty quickly because it just it's sucking a lot of energy out of the amplifier to uh, drive this thing. Now some people will say things like what about the iFi Diablo? Okay, yeah okay that one might have the power. I've not heard the Diablo. That's also under a thousand dollars and I don't know that you want to you know, match that with something that's 4K. Like I just, I think you'll be hamstringing this or any other headphone in this price range by attaching it to an amp like that, most likely. Maybe it's revelatory. It's been around a while, doesn't seem to be. We'll see, okay? Um, all that, so just, yeah, sure it folds up, sure it's easy to transport around. Um, why does that matter? It, it doesn't seem to, like I'm not, not sold on that actually being a selling point here. Okay, um, we will get into the sound now, and part of the sound is going to be the break-in story. So yeah, let's go ahead and jump into that. All right, the test gear that I used for sound here, I just mentioned the Hugo 2. I used that briefly to test this um, on a transportable amp. Uh, the DAC that I mainly used for this was my Berkley Alpha Series 2, which is connected to a Singer SU2 digital-to-digital uh, -digital converter via AES, and then the SU2 is USB to my computer. And then uh, the amps that I used, I haven't written down here, uh, Vioelectric HPA V281, SPL Fonitor X. I tried briefly the iFi iCan Pro Signature, and that's all I have written down. So those, okay? Um, all that. So the tuning here is definitely going for a Harman tuning, plus just a little bit of a bass shell from about 100 to 250 hertz. Yeah, you can tell that. Like it's very Harman uh, in that. So for some people that's good, and for others that's not. I like Harman does not bother me. I don't think there is anything inherently wrong with the Harman tuning. It is a completely valid tuning to use, in my opinion. Um, whether or not I like a headphone has a lot more to do with other features than just how close it hews to the, the Harman curve. Okay, but that, if that's what you like, that is what is here, again, with just a little bit of a bump from the, it kind of in the base to lower mid base of the 100 to 250 hertz in there, there's a little bit of a shelf on that. Okay, um, so that's the tuning. Now, it takes a while to really get to a point where you can evaluate this headphone and know what it is supposed to sound like. So into the controversy range again, break-in is real, and this headphone needs it, a lot of it, okay? Um, it took close to 100 hours, much like the Stealth. It's got the same driver as the Stealth, so it took close to 100 hours to fully break this thing in and for the frequency response to actually fully settle out and land on that pretty close to Harman target thing. 
um, in there too. So that happens. Also, it sounds a little bit veiled and, and, and muddled at, through the lower mids and all of that um, without break-in. And so some of the detail comes out um, once you break it in a little bit more too. So I had this set up on a secondary setup where the hi fi Min EF400 just drove this for basically six calendar days straight, okay, of just nonstop you know, 80 to 85 decibel average, beat the heck out of the drivers for that long to get them to um, break in. There's another aspect to the break in here too, and that is that these pads, which are soft and cushy now, also need a little bit of break in, and that impacts the sound too. You can maybe see, right now that without me squeezing these, I'll just try to like gently hold them here, here. So now I'm not squeezing the headband or the headphones together at all. You can kind of see here, maybe this view is better, that there is this noticeable groove that has formed in the headband. That was not there when these first came out of the box. This was completely flat and monolithic here on the back and the pads felt a little bit stiff. That is really important because the sound of these seems to be very dependent on how they sit on the head. Not just in terms of up, down, front, back, but in terms of driver membrane to ear distance. When I first had these and these pads were a little on the stiff side, I could just push them in slightly and the sound would just immediately improve. And by I mean slightly, I mean like a millimeter, okay? Something very small. And the sound, like particularly the bass, would just flesh out and it would sound a lot more full and rich than not. That full and rich sound came in naturally, it filled in naturally as the pads bore in. Okay, so there is a two-part journey when you buy these to getting them to where they're sounding like they are supposed to sound like. You've got to loosen up the driver a little bit and then you've got to wear these pads in. Now, will these pads wear into the point where they get too close, the, the driver gets too close to the head? Maybe. Unfortunately, I will not have these long enough to know whether or not that happens, but keep an eye on forums of owners of these things, and if that happens, you'll probably see reports of them there. Okay? All right. So just again, be prepared for that journey. But once you're through that, you get the harm and curve and all of that with the slight bass bump. There, the dynamics here, macro dynamics and all of that are improved from the stealth, which arguably had almost none. Okay, this is not that. This is a more dynamic presentation. Again, the physical aspects, um, like you know, the impact, a ma macro dynamic thing, and just like like the snappiness of like snare drums and that sort of thing like this is more dynamic than the stealth it is below average still in its dynamic ability for the four thousand dollar plus headphone tier now that can be a preference thing some people don't like to get smacked around by their sound so to speak and if that's you this is a really solid option okay um so again more dynamic than its sibling closed back model the stealth below average dynamics for the price class. Okay, um, the detail retrieval is pretty solid. Uh, it's not world beating, okay, but it is solid. Uh, I, you know, it's not a revelatory thing where it's like, um, revelatory, 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 that word, where you're like, oh, I'm hearing all kinds of new things and stuff I've never heard before. No, I didn't notice that but there is very good detail retrieval in here um, and some decent texturing and that sort of thing. Now, its sound stage is talked up. Its sound staging is wide uh, and there is pretty good positional effects laterally with imaging and separation. You know, where is the image coming from and then is there space between? Okay, that's pretty good. I found them to be a little bit flat in the depth dimension though. Not wall of sound, but not as deep as some of the competition models out there. Okay, now as far as those positional effects go, one thing that Dan Clark talked about in his interview with DMS is like what he wanted to do with the imaging is like not do points of sound. Like what he's saying that in to his hearing, 
imaging with headphones, and I assume he was talking about headphones that cost, you know, 4,000 plus, is that it's like, it's too pinpoint. Like there's no uh, width or body to that sonic image. It's just a singular point. And he argues that he was able to flesh out those singular points into roughly the size and shape of the instrument. Um, I don't agree. I don't, A, I didn't really notice that effect. So there, there's a couple things. One, I may very well just be hearing this differently than Dan. That's, I mean, we are different people with different ears and different you know, opinions on what we think sounds right. So that's probably a lot to do with it. Um, two, many instruments are mostly a point. Um, you think about a stringed instrument, like a violin, for example, the way that someone holds that, it's held here, and uh, my, my son is a, a violin player uh, right now, at least he's learning, and I should have had his violin for this. But anyway, you hold it here, and it's under your neck, and you're putting a bow across it here. The point that is creating sound, mostly, is that point of contact between the bow and the string, and then the vibration travels along the string. So the string itself is pointing, you know, is vibrating and creating the sound. Depending on how that's oriented, if it's oriented towards you on end, where you're looking down the neck of the violin, that's going to be a point source of sound. And then the width of that sound is just going to be like, depending on whatever angle that string makes with you and all that. But then you think about uh, a trumpet or a trombone or a saxophone, you've got that big of a space where the sound is coming from. So to some extent, yeah, it might sound like sounds are coming from a specific point in space. Um, I think that's natural on more instruments than not. Now, true, a drum skin, particularly a bass drum or a kick drum kind of thing is going to take up more space. Bass instruments, to me, usually fill out because, you know, you get below a certain frequency and you lose directional capability anyway, right? So I just, I don't, I'm not convinced that that was a huge problem to solve, for one thing. Um, but even so, I did not hear a noticeable difference between this, the, the, the spatial performance of this headphone and, like, these high fimans here, which I'll talk about more in a moment, or, like, Utopia or LCD5, D8000, Final D8000 Pro, like those kinds of things. So um, the imaging and the separation are good. I do think the staging is a little bit 2D in comparison to some of these others um, and all of that. But like it's, it's still pretty decent uh, overall. Okay. Um, Texturing and all of that is fine. Uh, pretty good texturing in there and the bass texture like you can hear the finger action on bass guitars and and all of that sort of thing um, coming through fairly clearly and and that sort of thing as well. Um, let's see what else the there's not a ton of air here like following the Harmon curve as there like the air is is not much and I think that one does hurt it a little bit on the sense of space um, but it also it uh, it even though the sound stage is big, it still kind of feels a little bit closed in. And I think that's because of the, the lower air in there. Now, some people don't like air. They don't think it's accurate and all of that. But I do think from a spatial feeling standpoint, that lack of air does make it feel just a little bit more closed in than the sound stage size would indicate or cause my brain anyway to expect. All right. So... <clears throat> it is a very good sounding headphone overall. Like I've been rather critical of it. It still sounds very good. All right. So um, how good and what is its value proposition is a thing that we need to talk about from a comparison standpoint. So let's break out these high fimans and I'll talk about some other things. All right, I'm back and I had to do a bit of rearranging here so that I could fit this on the table in front of me. So a lot of high fimen obviously. So here's the expanse. We have the high fimen HE1000 V2, 
Hi Feynman HE1000 SE, which Hi Feynman sent me for review, and that's going to be coming up very soon, I hope. And then Hi Feynman also sent me this Susvara because I think they were curious about my thoughts on how new challengers like this one, Focal Utopia, the new Utopia that's uh, either out now or coming very soon, or like the new ZMF Caldera, again, either out now or coming very soon. Um, that sort of thing, how all of those challenge their flagship model. So that's here too. All right, and then of course, I've also heard and will link to below, like at the original Focal Utopia, the Odyssey LCD5, Final D8000 Pro, uh, Abyss 1266, Abyss Diana TC and Diana Phi. Uh, what else have I heard way up there in that price range? Um, some electrostats like the, the Odyssey Carbon and the Stax 009S and, or was it 007S? I'd have to go back and look. One of those. Okay. Um, all of that. So I will make the claim that I have at least a decent handle on the 4K plus or at least 3K plus headphone market. All right. And so let's dive into that a little bit. Okay. As far as tuning goes, the Expanse is the most Harman-like. Hi-Fi mans are not far from Harman curves, generally older ones without the base shelf, and they don't do the ear gain region, the 2K, they don't ramp up the ear gain region quite as quickly as the Expanse does or other, or the Harman curve does, okay? And then they have a little bit more air frequencies going on with them too, but outside of that, they are more Harman than they are not, okay? Let's put it that way. Um, all that, whereas like, Utopia is a little bit more of a perceptive U-shape. I'd have to go back and look at its, its graph to know what it is. Uh, uh, the Odyssey LCD5 is almost as dead neutral as I've ever heard a headphone and, and so forth like, like that. So there are different tunings uh, going on at the, at the high end here. Now, this is, I mean, <laughs> In my opinion, I just I have to tell you straight up here, I don't think the Expanse does all of the things and challenges up at this level the way that the maker claims. Okay, um, I take no pleasure in saying that. Uh, I think it is more similar to the Heck V2 in terms of its detail retrieval than it is either of these. Okay, um, definitely behind sus, and you can say, well, that's 6,000 compared to 4,000, it should be. Okay, fair enough. Um, shouldn't be behind this one then. 3,500, 4,000, okay? They should at least be, I mean, it's not a blowout or anything like that. I just think that the, 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 the Hexi, okay, HE1000 SE, pulls out a little bit more micro detail than Expanse does. As far, oh, and then, um, so to me, that puts the, puts this behind Utopia, puts it behind LCD5 uh, in terms of detail retrieval, okay? Um, not a huge gap, but again, it is closer than it is here. As far as dynamics go, macro dynamics and micro dynamics, high Feynman's are not known for their physicality or their, their dynamic prowess. They're not poor in those regards, but it's not like the thing you associate with their sound usually, except maybe the HE6 series, okay? But with these guys, like it's more about huge staging, accurate imaging and separation, um, and timbre, at least to my ears, that's what it comes down to. And I think that's where they also have an advantage on the, the stealth. Like I do think these, they stage bigger than the Expanse does and I think they, and it's particularly noticeable in the depth, okay? It really is. Um, Duel of the Fates, a John Williams track from the Phantom Menace uh, film score. The way that one is recorded, and there's a video on YouTube where you can verify this, and I can link this below. John Williams, during the recording session, is standing on the maestro stand. He's got the, the semicircular arrangement of the orchestra in front of him, and then behind that, is the choir and the way the choir is arranged it's like you've kind of got like tenors in the center and you've got like 
male baritone is kind of here, male bass is here, and then you've got the female vocalists mostly, mostly clustered in between those groups. And these three pull that out better than The Expanse does. The Expanse just seems compressed this way in the depth a little bit there. Still very good, still excellent universal scale of headphones. Just not quite up there with these. Not going to do depth like Utopia does because that's a standout feature of Utopia. LCD5, also excellent in all three dimensions spatially, so it's not going to compete with LCD5 there either to my ear. Okay, um, back to the macro dynamics and the impact and all that. Like this one, it is behind these. Definitely behind LCD5 then and Utopia because those are very macro dynamic, way behind Abyss, okay, um, in terms of the physicality and that sort of thing um, up there at the price. Um, so I think that's enough for right now to uh, kind of say like, well, where does this one fit in? Uh, I think in terms of pure sonic performance, this is really more like a $3,000 headphone. Okay, so it is a bit overpriced, I think, for what you get purely sonically to my ear anyway. Uh, others are going to disagree. That's just really how my ears hear it uh, and how I understand the market context. Not just Hi-Fi Min, which I realize this is a Hi-Fi Min rich table, but all of the other things that I've heard and reviewed as well, placing this one um, up there in that group. So this is also where I want to make a comment of like, when you are paying money at this level here, this is now $2,000, by the way. Incredible deal. Incredible deal in hi-fi right now. But anyway, it lived most of its life at 3K. When you're paying at this level, like, what are you buying? And I think there is a few things. One, you are funding research and development. Part of the reason this cost $4,000 is that Dan and his team spent a lot of time figuring out how to do this build, okay, how to do all of this cool stuff on the build, how to hit that Harman curve with a base shelf in an open back, okay, um, and, and like how to do the staging and all of that the way he wanted it. And then, of course, like what materials were going to make the fit and this like elastic thing last and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Like what materials were going to make that work and what materials were going to allow sound to pass through one way and not the other. And all of those sorts of things like that costs money to research and figure all of that out. Thing is, every top of the line headphone has to go through a process like that. You really think Dan Clark is the only one using science to develop his product? No. Okay? No way. They all are. Okay? They just are not marketing it as aggressively scientifically as you are here coming from the Dan Clark camp. Okay? There's still a lot of ton of R still a ton of R&D time and money that went into first the HE1000 series, right? Because those came first, like 2015, the original HE1000 did, and then the V2 came out, okay? And then the SUS, the SUS Vara came out, and like big time research goes into that too, not just in how to tune it, but this is where Hi-Fi Min's stealth magnet tech started. How do you put magnets between the driver and the ear so that you get more membrane control, but then also minimize the impact that putting something physically between the, the membrane in your ear has on sound waves, okay? A lot of research and a lot of time and development and science goes into figuring that out, okay? So you're paying for research and development. That's one of the things that you're paying for at the top of the line level. hi -Fi Min is a good example because their stealth magnet tech has now trickled down throughout their line, like into the HE1000 SE, into the Aria Stealth Magnet Edition, into the Ananda Stealth Magnet Edition, into the Edition XS, so on and so forth, right? Cheaper models. So that, again, that is one thing you're paying for. I think we as consumers, though, primarily are 
paying for the ultimate listening experience that we can get at the time that we are buying. Okay, I think that for most of us is where we are. What ultimate listening experience means, of course, varies from person to person. Whoever is about to write that check, that's 2022, whoever is about to enter that credit card number on a web page, okay, that's who's determined, like that, they're after their ultimate learning, not learning, listening experience. How do we judge that from the outside and all of that? Because that I mean there are strengths to this sound. If you really want Harman tuning, you really want a nice, clean, pleasant sound, Expanse is good. It is very good at those things. I think these are two, but it is good at those things. Maybe it is the ultimate listening experience for you. For me, it's not. I prefer any of these three. I prefer Utopia, I prefer LCD5. Um, Final D8K Pro is kind of a wash, because uh, that has awesome at bass, a little bit wonky tuning in the mids. Um, and then I, like, I prefer this to Abyss easily. Okay. Um, anyway, like, what, like, how do we judge ultimate listening experience beyond, like, you know, someone says this is their ultimate listening experience, someone says this other thing is, like, how are we who might are considering, you know, entering in that credit card number on a company's website, how do we know whether it will be our ultimate listening experience? One, watch reviews. Two, does the thing stand the test of time? That also needs some explanation. The HE1000 series, I will argue, has stood the test of time. It was launched in, 20, in 2015 people still listen to it and still enjoy it a lot and talk about it. Sasvara was launched in 2017 and it is still widely considered to be the benchmark. So here, five plus years after its launch, it is still in large regard in the, you know, in the, in the conversation and audiophile circles and all of that, it's still the measuring stick. It has demonstrated itself to be the ultimate listening experience for a large number of people for several years. Okay, so that's one thing to account for. I would put Utopia in a class similar to that, at least the original Utopia. That is still a sought after, well respected, often talked about headphone. Just behind those, I would say like LCD5 is getting there. It's still newer, but you still see it and written about, heard it talked about in forums and all of that and on comment threads on YouTube. The breadcrumbs are there that that one's probably got staying power. Okay. Um, those are just examples of the point that I'm trying to make. I don't hear as much chatter about the stealth and I realize this is the expanse, but just as an example, I don't hear as much chatter about the stealth, the model, sibling model to this, sticking around here now a year after I initially reviewed it. Okay, my opinion, given the relative performance of this compared to these and other top shelf models, this one, I, I think it's also slightly going to fade. I don't think it will have the staying power of the SUS, of the Utopia, of what it looks like the LCD5 might have. Or, and it also, it doesn't have that singular excelling feature like um, the 1266 does with the base performance, okay? That is going to give it life beyond what its total performance package offers, I think, okay? Um, so, yeah, that's my takeaway. Uh, and I, I don't want to beat a dead horse there, so I think I will leave it there. So, wrapping it up. Dan Clark Audio Expanse headphones. Some really cool design features and ideas in it. Okay, it does sound very good. It is on an absolute scale, an excellent sounding headphone. It's just not quite $4,000 good to my ear, as is determined by the state of the market at four thousand plus dollars okay so i am wave theory this has been my review of the dan clark audio expanse 
Thanks for watching. If you haven't liked, please do that. If you haven't subscribed, please do that. Do that? Yeah, sure. And please remember to uh, check out my PayPal and my Patreon and all of that stuff. And as always, enjoy the music.